If you're looking for a health at every size support group, especially for diabetes diagnosis and concerns, well, you found it. I'm launching two groups with a fellow podcaster and health at every size registered dietitian, Glennis Oyston. She is the co-host of Dietitians Unplugged, and she's absolutely wonderful. We have two different groups. The first group meets on Mondays at 12 p.m. Eastern, and we start April 30th. The second group meets on Thursdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern and we start May 10th. For more information, shoot me an email and I will give you the link. Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. Hey listeners, did you know that you can get a free mini Body Kindness e-course? Visit bodykindnessbook.com and click get started. When you give your name and email, you'll be signed up for the course and you get a video reflection guide, a sample chapter from my book, Body Kindness, and I'll be checking in with you over email. I hope you sign up. And I also want to let you know if you're thinking about a little bit more support, I have two options. One, you can join a web-based group with the self-reflection prompts from me, and you can get that in a three-month trial visit bodykindnessbook.com slash spiral up. And I do one-on-one private coaching sessions. If you'd like to learn more, shoot me an email, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. All different ethnicities. What we're saying is that if we have more diversity within our field, we are going to just improve our accessibility as far as the the patients and clients who want to come work with us. It's going to enrich our practice. Um, We're going to become more effective We're definitely going to be more inclusive and we're going to be, if we're going to look at it from a marketing standpoint, we will be more attractive to the public, even if it's media or companies or, you know, the business community or, you know, anything, we're going to be more attractive to them if we have that. And there is, I see it so many times, there is plenty of work to go around in nutrition and dietetics just because of the nature of work that we do affects literally every human being on the planet. So there's plenty of work. It can only enrich us if we look at it from this aspect because the world is is changing. It's not staying in this aspect that it's it's not going to be diversified. It's if I don't think if we if we don't start to adjust and shift to this, we're actually putting ourselves in a more risky position to be overtaken by other professions that are having some kind of scope creep into our area. So I, I would tell them not to be concerned that this is something that is going to be, if we look at it from a positive perspective, this is something that going to, is going to enrich our uh, our practice and our profession. That was Tamara Melton. Tamara is a registered dietitian and educator and has worked in higher education for over 10 years. Today on Body Kindness, we're talking about the need to increase diversity in the field of dietetics, and you'll learn why it matters, including for anyone who's working on body kindness and stepping away from diets and weight-focused counseling. And Tamara's announcing a new nonprofit and sharing how you can get involved. The bottom line is, we will all do better at enhancing the health and well-being of others when everyone is represented. So size, race, ethnicity, gender, ability, sexual orientation. And, you know, we've known for quite some time that the lack of diversity interferes with quality health care. Tamara's taking action and focus in education. And it's really important to me that I could help her get this word out in our conversation today. We want to hear from you. Do you have a story about this? Have you had difficulty in getting helpful and compassionate care related to a lack of providers who meet your needs? Are you a helping professional and have something to say about your experience in the field? Shoot me an email, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com, and tomorrow and I will get in touch. Additionally, be sure to check out the show notes where you'll get a wonderful resource, a blog post, diversity is a good thing of more than 80 eating disorder professionals and activists. This list was compiled by Maria Paredes and Melissa Carmona. These are wonderful people to know, follow on social media, and connect with to learn and grow. Hey, Tamara, welcome to Body Kindness. It's so great to have you on the show. Hey, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's talk a little bit about our culture you know, take it a little bit bigger picture. You know, there are things happening right now that really indicate that we, we aren't as far as we think we are when it comes to intersectionality and, uh, race issues. And I'm Mm -hmm. thinking particular of, uh, what happened at Starbucks. Um, and I would Mm -hmm. just love 
your take on like where we're at as a culture, what what is, you know, through the Starbucks example, what is happening um, and why it's so problematic? I think right now, because of the, you know, the availability of recording devices like phones and things like that, we see more visibly now situations that have been going on to people of color or affecting people of color in this country across the world. So like the Starbucks incident where, you know, two black men were waiting for a colleague, business colleague, and, you know, the manager of Starbucks asked them to leave. But there are things like that happening all the time. And the woman who actually recorded that at Starbucks said she wanted to do it because black people say that happens and people don't believe them. And I just, my husband and I actually just had an incident like that this past weekend. We took our daughters to the ballet here in Atlanta for the first time. This is their first ballet and they love ballet. And we just, it was last minute. So they had on, you know, they were well-dressed, but jeans and t-shirt. We didn't have time to do like a fancy dress and everything, but we get to the ballet and the lady who's helping us to, to actually seat us, she looks down at our girls and she said, oh, well, they can't read. So they don't need any programs. And my daughters are four and six. And it was interesting just to kind of hear her so flippantly say that and make this assumption about them. And my husband actually said to her, no, they can read and they need a program. And she actually pushed back and said, no, they probably can't read. And he said, no, they can read and they need a program. And it doesn't matter anyways, they should just get one. And when things like that happen, I just, you know, kind of think of it to, if you are coming across a young person or a student who's interested in coming to a field like nutrition and dietetics, where we don't have that many people of color. And if because of some unconscious bias that you have, or that we may have, which we all have them, that you say something like that, if there's no parent around or there's no other person who's kind of their guardian who can do as like my husband did in our situation with our girls and kind of stand up for them and say, no, they have the potential to be able to do this. Don't just make that assumption because of what you think about them and how they look. Think about how devastating that can be to them. That's very discouraging to them. And then they might decide to go off and do something else. So for people of color, little things happen like that all the time. And so it is probably going to be happening with students who are thinking about coming into the field of dietetics as well. So that's something just really for people to be aware of. And I think now with, with, you know, with what happened with the Starbucks incident, it's becoming more aware to people who just haven't seen it and they may not actually do it. So they may not realize it's happening to people of color. So it's just important to know that that's something that for someone of color happens many, many times throughout their lifetime. And it starts to build up over time. It's just something that it's very important to be aware of it, I think. I mean, absolutely. And it's, I mean, it's, it's microaggressions, right? So it's mm-hmm. like, it can be unconscious bias. I know a lot of people hear about bias and racism, right? And the first thing, I'm not a racist, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, right. um, actually fighting the urge to say that is probably more likely that you're, you're more of an ally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if that's the first thing you're going to say, then you have ally work to do. And, um, mm-hmm. and, but just to understand that there, that, that these microaggressions build up and pile up and they do affect people. They, they hurt mm-hmm. their self-esteem and well-being, confidence. And, and so if you imagine these things that might not even relate to, um, going to college and what, you know, what do I want to be for a career? They absolutely do intersect. Right. And then you go and you're in school and maybe you are interested in nutrition, right? I hope. But Mm -hmm. then you look at what we offer and when you can't see yourself represented, it's like, it feels like a closed door or like, you know, no one's rolling out like, welcome, you belong banner. Yeah. And there's some people I, you know, I had, we had our, our Georgia dietetic conference a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to a group of black dietitians and a couple of them who are at a, a local university here. They have actually mentioned very directly, people have said to them, professors, but well, you're not going to make it into an internship. <gasps> so very directly. What? So it, it could be. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, sometimes it's very direct. People are saying things and sometimes it could be unconsciously there. They might be saying something, but no, there was two different women who were mentioning the same professor who's obviously teaching in, in a university. And this is over the span. I think they have several years between them, you know, attending this university. That's just horrible, you know? And I mean, I think it, I think it hurts us all, right? Like we, I mean, 
So we're talking specifically both about being registered dietitians, right? Part of this medical community, but the medical community exists in the culture and Mm -hmm. we're supposed to be about not doing harm. We're supposed to be about helping people. We're supposed to be about connecting people. We're supposed to be, you know, about healing and growth. And how can we do that if our profession doesn't look like the rest of the Mm -hmm. world? Right. Yeah. It's not just, it does, you know, research shows that patients do better when they um, are working with uh, professionals, healthcare professionals who are from their same culture. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be everybody who works with them, but just someone who can identify with them uh, within that spectrum. And we think about with food and nutrition, it's something that, you know, touches, it has so much of a basis in the culture of someone and their values that, it can only make sense that if we diversify it, that our profession, that it's going to help to meet the needs of our, of the, the communities that we serve. Yeah. I mean, I'm a hundred percent on board with that. And I also think that there's, I feel like I've heard about diversity ever since I became a dietitian mm-hmm. and I thought it really, it was a lot of lip service. I'm like, I don't think we're any more diverse and I've been a dietitian <laughs> for like 20 years. So I'm not you know, like, I don't know if it just, it truly takes this long or are we lacking true effort to really pay attention to, you know, put enough resources and pay attention to the true gaps. Do you have any thoughts on that? I do think that I have similar feelings to you that I have been a dietitian for a little over a decade now. And i have heard about the the increases. We need to increase in in diversity, but not really true action. Um, Looking at barriers, you know, we talked about about barriers for for students of color and what they have to deal with. They kind of come out kind of behind the eight ball and coming into their programs, at least in in college and things like that, and then financial aid and all these other different things that are going on that could affect them reaching their goals. And what are the, the programs or the resources that are in place for them to actually address those needs that they have. And that I haven't seen change very much. I do know there are definitely DPGs that are out there um, mm-hmm. that are focused on, nobody and that's focused on Blacks and, and dietetics and, and LIDOM, that's Latinos and, and dietetics. And there's other ones that are that are focused on other groups like uh, for Muslims or for, and for um, people of the Jewish faith and, and men and different things like that. But as far as really, you know, really focusing on um, for diversity as far as uh, race and ethnicity, I haven't seen the needle move very much either. I do have to say at this point, and this is someone who's been involved in these organizations, they are full of people who really want to make it happen. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot. It's a lot to to try to take on. And there's a lot of competing resources for any funds or anything like that. And I get that. But it has, I have to say, it feels like it's, it's been, at least to me and my perspective of it, a lot of lip service. I haven't seen much change in going from Fincy, my very first one when I went in 2003 mm-hmm. in Anaheim, to the one that I went to in Chicago last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think that when there is, where there's a lack of change, you know, it can be very frustrating and deflating. Then it could also be inspiring because it just mm-hmm. forces other people to take action and do the work that's not getting done. And I'm excited for you to talk more about, about um, some meaningful action that you have decided to, to take. And I just would love for you to share it. Yes. I'm very excited about this. And it's a, I hope as a story, you know, years from now, we can look back and say, this is what happened when Rebecca and and other people were involved with this. But so I've been having this, this, you know, since you and I met at Fincy last year and some other things that happened in the month since. And I thought, well, what could, you know, younger people and young professionals and, and students maybe in, later in high school or coming into college, what do they need if they're of color to be able to be attracted to the field of nutrition and dietetics and then actually be successful in completing their studies and actually going on and practicing? And so I said, they need a community. They need an, an organization that will that will foster this and, and help to mentor them and provide them resources and, and give them examples of dietitians of color who are in practice right now. And so I thought the, of the idea to form a nonprofit to do this. And so I've actually been doing the work to actually pull this together, really using social media, which is where young people are right now, and talking to folks like yourself and also other dietitians of color to say what are the resources that we can provide for these for these people. And just so happened that just very recently, thanks to the, the magic that is social media, Des and Wendy of Food Heaven Show 
posted something about diversity and a dietitian named Deanna Bellany reached out to them and said, I'm really interested in doing something related to diversity. And they said, you need to talk to Tamara Melton. And she and I connected. And I have to say, when she and I spoke on the phone, we had, I had chills in that she and I were thinking so much on the same lines of this nonprofit organization that would help to increase diversity by giving the resources and mentors to to students who are interested in coming to this area that I was just thrilled. And so she and I decided to to collaborate in this and to to form an organization called Diversified Dietetics, nonprofit organization. The goal is to kind of three arms, to to mentor um, students of color and young professionals who are looking to go into dietetics, to contribute resources to them, to kind of help them get over those humps of those barriers where where students do fall behind or fall out. So, you know, if it's financial aid or getting through that biochem class or applying for internships, if you don't get in, what's the next step? And then landing your first job, how do you feel comfortable in a professional environment where you might again be the only person of color who's there? And then because representation does matter, the third arm is to provide examples for dietitians of color in practice. And so she, Deanna and I actually both looked at another organization called MLT. And MLT is in the business community and it's a very successful nonprofit organization that um, helps to foster students of color and young leaders of color in the business community. And when she said that she was thinking of MLT and I was too, both of our partners in the business world, that's when I had the chills because I thought this is a, you know, this, okay, this is, this is something that we need to do. So that's, that's something I'm really excited about. We are launching the website. And once you go on there, if you go to diversitydietetics.org, you can choose, you know, do I want to be a mentor? Do I want to contribute resources? Do I want to be an example uh, if you are a dietitian of color in practice? And we are including this to, to everyone. You know, if you're a dietitian who is a white dietitian, you're not of color, and you're a majority dietitian, if you would like to contribute resources as well, I have to say I don't have any mentors. I did not have any mentors for many years who were of color in nutrition. Mm-hmm. So that's not the only person who can mentor them, but the ones who did help me really understood, really, really understood where I was coming from. And so that's our goal is that if you are someone who wants to work with students of color, there are some, you want to understand their background and, and do realize if you do have any unconscious biases, you know, what are those and, and how could that affect a, a mentorship relationship, um, things like that. So we're really excited about the launch of Diversified Dietetics and and hoping that we can really start to form a community where we're getting the, the word out that we can attract students. Mm-hmm. and young professionals and get them into this this profession. And that will lead into us diversifying our profession and then better serving the communities mm-hmm. um, that we work with. Yes, this is amazing. I'm so, so excited to see, you know, meaningful action happening and, you know, with things people could do because like right now for anyone who's listening, they can, you know, check it out. They can recommend it to other people. Like, what would you say? You know, somebody's listening is like, oh, diversify dietetics. I want to learn more, whether it's I want to share it with dietetic internships or get myself involved, share it on social to support and signal boost it. What would you say is the thing that you need the most right now? So we are really going to spend a lot of time, you know, getting the mentor relationships um, set up. So if they want to serve as a mentor, that would be great. They can go to the website and and sign up for that to contribute resources. So if you follow, you can just put in for Instagram or Facebook, the hashtag diversified dietetics, just to follow that, to see what we're doing um, and to be able to just, you know, share the posts that we have and, and share stories and, and provide feedback as well, because this is a community. So this is a, you know, very much two-way communications. They could do that as well. If you're a dietitian of color, know a dietitian of color or a student who could be featured, uh, that would be great to let us know and, and just kind of get the word out. And that would be really helpful because then the more that we share it, and if we're using social media, I think getting out in those, those channels, then it's just going to do what social media does and to go, you know, use mm-hmm. that virility and get out there. But if you are someone who would like to contribute, just go over to the website, um, diversitydietetics.org and let us know how you'd like to be a part of it. And we are very much looking for um, to build this community up. Yeah. And so while this is taking shape and uh, evolving, I don't really think that we can just sit and wait until we're at that all kind of ultimate goal where mm-hmm. 
we are better able to serve clients because people can connect culturally. So what is the intermediate step then before we're actually more diverse? Mm -hmm. So Deanna actually, as we were speaking, she had thought of this. She works in public health. And so she definitely, I think, sees this as she's working with the the community and the dietitians that she's working with where we will also have the goal of of helping um, dietitians who are white dietitians and other ones who are working with other, if I'm working with, you know, another um, ethnicity that's not my own to improve cultural competency and give those practicing RDs um, the resources that they need to improve, really improve cultural competency. And then also the resources that you need that if you come across a student of color, how can you help identify that student and help to mentor them? Because I think that we all are coming across different young people or students, it could be second career, um, who are interested in coming into this field. People are very interested in it, but are you aware and how can you help them? If it's somebody who doesn't have, you know, the financial resources to, to start into a, a dietetic program right away, or they've never had anybody go to college before, what can you really do? So we're going to create those resources as well, because I think sometimes people think, I don't know, I don't identify with them, so I don't know how to help them. So that's another portion of the resources that will be out there for practicing dietitians right now. That's great. Yeah, because it's, I mean, hopefully training has evolved, but I can't even say really much in our school. Like you might read a paragraph in one book in community nutrition about cultural competency, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But not, you know, it's the same way dietitians might, well, I don't know the same because we really should be better trained, but you know how dietitians complain that doctors don't get any nutrition and then they dole out go on whole 30 or (laughs) we get mad, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's just, it's just an inadequate, you know, our needs aren't getting met and the community needs aren't getting met. And so we need to, you know, do what we can to, to create positive Mm -hmm. change. And what would you say to maybe, my guess is that there's that kind of response, right? From you know, the dominant thin white female dietitian who might feel like either like, I don't get it or like, oh, like, what if I, what if I, you know, what's that going to mean for my future? Like some uncertainty Mm -hmm. that they might bottle up inside and that fear might keep them from supporting this very important change. Do you have any words of wisdom that you could share so people don't confuse what this is? Yeah, I definitely would ask, you know, dietitians to remember who we serve and it's everybody who eats and that's everyone on the planet. So um, (laughs) there's plenty, there's plenty of work to go around. Um, And I think that, you know, with in, in westernized nations, it's just becoming more diverse. We are going to be more attractive to all audiences if we are more diverse. I mean, you can't help but look out there and see, you know, people who are quote unquote nutritionists or naturalists or whoever they are, if they're diverse and there's a diverse community, they're going to go to them because they look like that. So if we increase our diversity within our own profession, we are going to further elevate that we are the experts because we are the experts who represent every group that we're working with. And there's going to be plenty of room for us all to work with all different ethnicities. What we're saying is that if we have more diversity within our field, we are going to just improve our accessibility as far as the the patients and clients who want to come work with us. It's going to enrich our practice. Um, We're going to become more effective. We're definitely going to be more inclusive. And we're going to be, if we're going to look at it from a marketing standpoint, we will be more attractive to the public even if it's media or companies or, you know, the business community or, you know, anything, we're going to be more attractive to them if we have that. And there is, I see it so many times, there is plenty of work to go around in nutrition and dietetics just because of the nature of work that we do affects literally every human being on the planet. So there's plenty of work. It can only enrich us if we look at it from this aspect because the world is, is changing. It's not staying in this aspect that it's, it's not going to be diversified. It's if, I don't think if we, if we don't start to adjust and shift to this, we're actually 
putting ourselves in a more risky position to be overtaken by other professions that are having some kind of scope creep into our area. So I, I would tell them not to be concerned that this is something that is going to be, if we look at it from a positive perspective, this is something that going to, is going to enrich our, uh, our practice and our profession. We haven't talked much about uh, size diversity, and mm-hmm. I would also look into that, the intersections of size and gender and race and sexual orientation, which are, you know, I think that they're all very important. I, you know, I wonder if our, I'm just openly wondering here, but, you know, Mm -hmm. just knowing, you know, me coming from, you know, a strong health at every size space, I am, I'm really wondering how our field will respond to the clear need that we also need dietitians at higher weights. It's so funny that you said that because as, as I was just speaking before, I was thinking, you know, the diversity amongst different cultures and mm-hmm. ethnicities means diversity in size. And mm-hmm. so I know, you know, in the African-American community, you know, larger size women are celebrated. They're seen as attractive in the Latina community, some of them as well. And I think that that is going to shift and change what it means to be, what is, what is the the look of health look like, um, not just, you know, your skin color, but your size and your shape, because that's something, it's just genetics, right? It's something that we've seen that, that varies amongst different ethnicities. It's so funny that you thought of that too, because I was thinking that I'm like, that is something that's also going to make us seem more, um, realistic to people. If we have more diversity, there's going to be with the inclusion of, of other um, ethnicities, we're going to start to see this variability in size and shapes that just comes with, different cultures. Mm -hmm. And that has to be a good thing too, because that now says to the public, wow, you know, there are different ways and there are different sizes that I can be at and still be healthy. And I'm not fighting against my genetics and the way that my mother is shaped and my grandmother was, or my daughters will be, or things like that. And I can fit into that, to that idea of what it is to be healthy. Yeah, absolutely. We really need to see diversity in all areas and all the beautiful intersections. And, you know, back how we were kind of talking about representing our population, Mm -hmm. what is really interesting to me to see how, you know, I would say this wave of body positivity is growing among dietitians. And, 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 you know, so you hear some dietitians embrace that. You hear others, you know, also embracing health at every size, which I love, right? And so mm-hmm. I love seeing this growth of like anti-diet. And of course, because we're not trained in that, it's a whole learning and growing process that happens. But what I find, what I find really interesting about all of that is that if that matters to you, it will also matter to advocate for what we're talking about here in the diversity space because you can't really take down the things that upset you about our diet and wellness culture without tackling the idea that there's something wrong with you if you're at a higher weight, that you must be sick, you must be knocking on death's door, or, you know, the weight mm-hmm. stigma. Like we have to understand that we need to address weight stigma too and the intersections of weight stigma and you know, oppression based on race and gender and sexual orientation and stuff. And I was on Instagram the other day and there's an Instagrammer I follow. Her name's I am Ivy Felicia. Mm -hmm. And her post was, have you ever noticed how many quote healing and wellness brands erase larger bodies? And I, I won't read the whole thing. I'll link to it in the show notes. But she says something's wrong when people and brands who claim to offer healing and wellness totally erase larger bodies from their marketing offerings and scope of practice. If you're not a larger bodied fat person, then you might not even notice that the void exists. However, Mm -hmm. I invite you to take a look at your favorite wellness accounts and see how many people of size you notice in the visuals. Just like people of color have been erased for years, people of size experience the same erasure. You will very seldom see larger bodied person in the visuals of those healing wellness, holistic brands you love so much. Why is that? Because wellness is associated with whiteness, thinness, able bodies, and wealth. And there's more, but I was like, boom. Yeah. Yep. 
you know? And so, I mean, it is, it is, that is the intersection. So she, and she goes on and she, she identifies she's a fat woman of color. Um, and so if you think about it, coming from her and her lived experience, and she does body relationship, she's the body relationship coach. So she does body image healing work and she's looking at these spaces, not seeing herself represented and making this connection of how the whole idea of wellness is upheld by Mm -hmm. thinness and whiteness and able-bodied people. And that needs to be busted. Exactly. And dietitians are in the wellness space. (laughs) We're in the wellness space. And if we don't see that, 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 yeah, there's, that's a whole nother show. I feel like we're going to for that. If we'd start talking about, you know, when you do equate where, where we, especially in Western culture have, have decided that, what wellness looks like, it, mm-hmm. it does equal wealth. Mm-hmm. And we know that does not track with a lot of people of color. Mm-hmm. It does equal thinness. That does not track necessarily with a lot of people of color. It's just so many things or so many societal things that they don't connect if you're just having this one ideal. And you're right that the, you know, that, that the crushing part is the, the erasure. And when you're of the majority, you don't notice it, just like she said, that Instagrammer said, when you are of color, let me tell you, it's one of the most glaring things that you see all the time. Can you speak a little bit more to that? So it's, you know, uh, you, I, I can say personally for myself, I, I read this about uh, a gentleman who was writing about this, a black man, he's a businessman. And he's saying, you know, what, what we think about if you're in a professional meeting, if you walk into the room, the first thing you do is you do kind of a scan to see, is there anybody else of color? And then Maybe if you're a woman, you check as well. And then you're, you're trying to see, well, maybe the help is of color. And then that lets you know, uh, how do I need to comport myself, especially if it's with people that I'm not very familiar with, or if you're walking into an elevator, you know, you are, especially if you're a black man, you know, are there, do I need to step back off if I'm making anybody feel uncomfortable, maybe. So I might Mm want to go in a different direction, or if you are of color and you're a student and you come into the room and you realize, okay, you know, if there's another color student of color okay, I don't have to be the only person to represent for my whole, my whole race while I'm here. There's so many things that you're thinking about that for me takes up brain space. And mm-hmm. so I know for myself, I work in data analytics. And so when you're layered, trying to even process data analytics in a meeting, but I'm also layering on top of, oh, did she say that to me because I'm black? Are they assuming I can't do this because I'm a black woman? Just think of that every single day. Your day is, is layered with those, those thoughts. And it's real. If you talk to um, to people of color, I would ask you to pull them. They might unconsciously be thinking about it. But if you ask them to kind of think, how many times per day are you thinking about, am I the only person of color who's here? And then, and then how do I need to adjust the way that I'm acting or speaking or, or um, sitting or even just being here? Am I making other people uncomfortable? And if I decide I want to kind of buck the system and make them uncomfortable, what consequences am I going to have to deal with because of that? that's things that we think about a lot. You know, I could really see what you're doing with diversity and dietetics. I could see that that actually ends up being one of the primary ways you end up helping people who are participating is the resilience to the microaggressions. Yeah. You just, uh, yeah. How do you keep on going? And this is true. I've had times where I have, been at conferences and I've had to take a break just to recharge myself, go listen to music that I'm comfortable with or see pictures of my family or friends, or I've talked to people who said, you know, I just need to take a break. Or I've had some coworkers of mine of color after everybody leaves, we kind of have our after work, after meeting huddle to kind of boost each other up and then keep on going for the day. And so, yes, doing this diversity work just gives people of color, somebody else who might understand what they're going through. Maybe that means they now have a coworker who looks like them, that they can help to boost them up and help them get over these microaggressions because they are affecting them every single day and it saps your, your energy. Yeah. And I mean, all I can do in my mind is, is sit and listen to that because I have too much privilege and there, there are one of the key ways in my life where I lack privilege is in the past for me now, but it has to do with financial, which Mm -hmm. research wise is, you know, like we had food stamps and everything like that. And, um, research shows so socioeconomic status is a big barrier to health and well-being. but 
What I find really interesting about it is that it's an oppression I can hide. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it was the past for me. So I can think of memories to where I felt where I've been excluded. And, you know, even based on geography of growing up and what I lack access to around education and things. But mm-hmm. I've also, I have an education and I have a job and I, I am financially secure now. So there is no way that I can really say I 100% understand what that experience is like to have regular worry about how am I acting in this room and how do I need to change myself to be better accepted in this room. And that just, it sounds very stressful and very unnecessary. Yeah. And it, it is. And I, I think for myself, I, um, you know, I grew up in, I went to majority white schools. And when you're a little kid, you don't notice it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's probably when I moved to this, my family moved to the South and I definitely noticed it because ironically I was in a black school, but told I talked too white. So then I felt it there. But then as I grew up um, and started to, you know, go into college and and went off to to grad school and then start working as a professional, um, especially with having those formative preteen onward years in the South. And I'm very aware of of the, the different, you know, challenges that people of color are facing. It's one of those things where, like you said, the resilience, I really have learned ways to kind of hype myself up to just say, yeah, you're going to have to work 175% more just to show people that what they assume about people who look like you, like you said, I can't take off my skin color, but let them see that, oh yeah, there is this black woman who's working as a dietitian, and for me, the ultimate nerd data analytics <laughs> is <laughs> when I walk into a room, they're kind of like, oh, okay, you know, and I, for me now, I've flipped that into whenever I, I get that kind of like, ah, oh, look from, from white people. I'm like, okay. And I put that in my little deposit and it keeps me going, but that doesn't happen for everyone. And that's my personality. And I very, very much recognize that for some people, it just becomes too much. And they just can't handle it. And especially if they have other stressors in their life, like all of us do, right? They're trying to take care of their family and things like that. It can just be a bit too much. And so that's why I think creating a community where people can can feel safe and, and they can feel like someone is understanding where they're coming from and helping them to, to be successful, um, not giving them a handout, but just realizing I need a little bit more because I've got a little bit more coming against me then that I think is, is really important. That's just, that's just the kindness of, of being a human. Yes. And that's what it all comes down to is we have a common humanity. And I think if there's one thing I would hope all humans want, it's to leave the world a better place than we inhabited it. And there are ways in which we do that every day. And there are ways in which we really screw that up. <laughs> and this is one piece of a way where we can look to make things better. And I think that hopefully for any listener, I feel like my takeaways are a listener who's not a dietitian, who's listened this far, understand that any difficulties and struggling you're having around body kindness, self-love and acceptance, kindness toward yourself, that you're not born with that. It's put in to you systemically, culturally, in your family system, schools, all of that. As we touched on, hopefully it um, resonated about how that there's this whole wellness culture that idolizes and holds up thin white women, but also it's oppressive. And then it excludes people of color and of size from getting to participate in wellness, which is part of what makes wellness sick, right? And Mm -hmm. so, and look at you know, dietitians are their food and nutrition experts and they're everywhere and hospitals and communities doing nutrition informatics, uh, writing, <laughs> you know, and if, if there is no diversity there, if it's really, really poor, then, then it is part of the problem. It is complicit of the system of this sick wellness culture that doesn't actually really help people. I mean, you're taking it and you're running with it and you're getting people involved and you are going to make a difference with this diversified dietetics. You're going to make a big difference in helping, you know, create change that matters in the field of medicine and, and in our culture. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I'm so excited you and I met 
way back when it was years ago, but it, you know, in Chicago and had that connection and that you listen. I think that was so heartwarming to me and probably one of the kindest things that you could have done. Probably didn't even realize it at the moment, but it just was one of those many times where somebody kind of boosted me up and I thought this is important work to do. So I'm really excited about it um, and really hope that people embrace it and, and can be a part of this community too. Well, I fully support it and I hope that we get lots of lots of interest. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for talking to me today. And what what's the website again where people can follow up? The website and um, on Facebook and Instagram is diversifyddietetics.org is a website and the same thing, Diversify Dietetics for Instagram and Facebook. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rebecca. And that's our show. Let's continue this conversation in our Facebook group. Just search Body Kindness Podcast and ask to join the group. We also love ratings and reviews. Please subscribe to the Body Kindness Podcast and give us an honest rating and review. And if you can, tell a friend. If you'd like to support the podcast for the 2018 season, please donate at gofundme.com slash bodykindness.